Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Mark Pfeiffer from the, uh, the Hmong Cultural Center, and I'm going to be presenting some of the material from our Building Bridges Hmong 101 curriculum. Let's start with uh, Hmong population uh, around the world. The largest Hmong population is in China, and uh, you know I think academic scholars that really the the current estimate is about four to six million Hmong in China. Uh, there is some confusion over the fact that the government of China puts the Hmong in the Miao M I A O uh, minority classification, and there are some other ethnic groups in China that are also put under the Miao group. And sometimes the Miao number is as high as 10 to 15 million have, have been cited as the Hmong population in China, and that's inaccurate. Uh, as I said, there are several other minorities in the Miao group. So in the last few years, uh, there have been some scholars who put out some articles, and the estimate is uh, about 4 to 6 million Hmong in China. Um, there's also a Hmong population in Vietnam. Um, usually the estimate's about 800,000 to 1 million. And uh, a few years ago, the government of Vietnam did a national census, and they found about 787,000 Hmong in Vietnam. There's also about, uh, or just over 300,000 Hmong estimated in, in the country of Laos. And um, what happened is, or it's, it's widely believed that the Hmong population went down quite a bit in Laos uh, after 1975. Uh, Hmong refugees fled out of Laos after the communists took over the country uh, at the end of the, uh, the Vietnam War era. So there could have been as many as 500,000 Hmong in Laos before 1975, but the current estimate is just over 300,000. There's also Hmong in Thailand. The estimate's about 120,000. And then there's also a small Hmong population in the country of Burma along the border with Thailand, uh, just a couple thousand. Uh, when we look at the Western countries, of course, the United States has the largest Hmong population. Um, the 2000 census found about 186,000 uh, Hmong in the U.S. And we, of course, we know that since the year 2000, the Hmong population has, has definitely grown in the U.S. Uh, uh, there have been the 15,000 Hmong refugees from the Wat in Thailand just over the past two years have come, for example. Uh, the community estimate of the Hmong population in the United States usually is around maybe 250 to 275,000 Hmong in the U.S. Um, there's also a small Hmong population in the country of France and mostly living around the Paris region, probably less than 10,000. Uh, there is a small Hmong community also in Australia. Uh, we receive estimates from some scholars in Australia, uh, the Hmong community being uh, just under 2,000 in population in Australia. That's mostly the Tasmania region of Australia that the Hmong will live in. Uh, there is a very small Hmong population in Canada, uh, just in the hundreds, and they mostly live in southern Ontario. Uh, that's the Kitchener area, um, and that's a couple hours west of Toronto. Uh, there's also Hmong communities in French Guiana at the top of South America. There's at least three different towns in French Guiana with, with Hmong communities. And there's also a Hmong uh, community in one town in Germany. Uh, we have heard about Hmong in some other parts of South America, uh, but we don't have good estimates of these numbers. Okay, well, I'd like to briefly show you where the Hmong live in China. and. Um, you can see on the map at the, the bottom of China, sort of the south central area, it's uh, the largest Hmong populations in China are in Yunnan and Guizhou provinces. And you can see those, those two provinces on the map, Yunnan and Guizhou provinces. When we look at uh, Southeast Asia, the Hmong are in northern Vietnam, central to northern Laos, central to northern Thailand and along the border with, with uh, Burma and, and northern Thailand. Uh, historically, Hmong did not make it down into uh, Cambodia. They did not make it that far south in Indochina. Okay, I'd like to move now to the origins of the Hmong people in China and Southeast Asia. 
Well, there's not a lot of good uh, scholarly information on the ancient history of the Hmong. Um, but there's pretty uh, wide agreement among scholars that the Hmong have been in China for at least 5,000 years. Uh, I think where there are questions in the research that have not, in, in the literature that have not been resolved, are, you know, it, those questions are related to uh, the origins of the Hmong people. Were they always in China or did they come from somewhere else? And there have been some theories that the Hmong came from other parts of the world. For example, um, Russia, uh, uh, so actually, you know, Siberia, that part of uh, you know, uh, the former Soviet Union. Also, there is a theory that the Hmong came from the Middle East, but there's a lack of good evidence, scholarly evidence, to support these theories. Uh, but there are records, uh, you know, in, from China that indicate or the, the Hmong are mentioned going back 5,000 years in China. Let's now move to uh, recent Hmong history, and let's look at a timeline of recent Hmong history. Well, something very important happened um, just about, or maybe 215, 210 years ago, and that's when Hmong started migrating out of southern China to Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand. So that actually occurred relatively recently in history. The Hmong had been in China all that time. Uh, there was a lot of persecution of Hmong in China by the Han majority uh, in the 1790s and through much of the uh, 19th century, and the Hmong started moving into Southeast Asia over the border of China at that time. We get into more recent history, uh, 1963 to 1975. Uh, that was, of course, the era of the Vietnam War, and the Hmong were assisting the CIA. Uh, in, in fighting the, the secret war in Laos. Uh, 1975, that's when the Vietnam War came to an end and the communists took power in Laos and a lot of the Hmong started fleeing out of Laos as refugees to Thailand. And really that refugee movement continued um, from late 1975, early 1976 through the early 1990s. However, um, even though most of the refugee camps with a lot of Hmong living in, in them in Thailand had closed by the uh, probably 1992-93, there were quite a few Hmong refugees from Laos still stuck in Thailand uh, really with no status. And a lot of them moved over to a Buddhist temple where they were given uh, shelter by a Thai Buddhist monk and that was Wat Tham Krabak. And those people were kind of uh, forgotten about for many years um, but after lobbying for several years by uh, Hmong organizations here in the U.S., um, the State Department agreed to accept the uh, 15,000 of the Hmong refugees from Wat Tham Krabak into the U.S. That was December 2003 that the State Department announced the uh, uh, resettlement that would occur from Wat Tham Krabak. And the first Hmong refugees from the Wat started arriving in the U.S. in June 2004. And that has continued up to the, the uh, present time, uh, you know, the summer of 2006, though most of the people had come probably by the end of 2005 to the U.S., about 15,000 people from the Watt. All right, well, I'd like now to uh, begin to talk about the Hmong role in the CIA's secret war in Laos and, um, and how that all got started. Well, if you look at the history books, if you came to the Hmong Cultural Center and you came into our library and you looked at what the books, what some of the books have to say, um, there were a couple key things that happened that uh, you know helped get the Hmong involved, working with the CIA to to fight the communists in Laos and you know uh, fighting the secret war during the Vietnam War era. And one of the first uh, important uh, individuals was a guy named Mr. Pop. Um, his, his full name was Edgar Buell, and he was a retired Indiana farmer um, and sort of a humanitarian uh, 
worker, did a lot of sort of medical work in, in Hmong villages in, in Laos. And he, he came to Laos in the late 1950s, but he also had some connections uh, to, you know, the, the CIA. Um, a really a more formal relationship started in 1961 when Colonel Bill Lair, representing the CIA, met with General Vang Pao, uh, you know, leader of the Hmong army in Laos, and they initiated a secret cooperative relationship between the Hmong and U.S. operatives in Laos. And in the slide, uh, you can see uh, training, uh, the CIA officers training the Hmong in late 1961 in Laos. I'm going to move to Hmong refugees from the Wat. Well, as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, as Ban Vinai, that was the biggest Hmong refugee camp in Thailand and a couple other refugee camps in Thailand with a lot of Hmong. They closed, those camps closed 1992, 1993, but there were still quite a few Hmong refugees from Laos who, you know, were left in Thailand and they had no status. Uh, they feared um, going back to Laos and what might happen to them. So many of them moved to um, Wat Tham Krabak. Uh, which was about an hour north of Bangkok, and they were given shelter by a Thai Buddhist monk, uh, you know, strongly opposed to communism. So they, I think that really started happening in 1991-92, a lot of the Hmong started moving to the temple. Um, but I think it was 2000-2001, the, the Thai Buddhist monk um, who had given them uh, shelter, uh, he died. And the status of the Hmong living in, in the temple in Thailand became much more uncertain. And that's why um, the American Hmong organizations really started pressing their efforts to get the U.S. State Department to agree to resettle these Hmong refugees in the U.S. And again, that was December 2003 um, that that formal agreement that 15,000 Hmong from the Wat in Thailand would be resettled into the U.S. occurred. Um, if we look now at the number of these people in Minnesota, um, the total number across the U.S. of these Hmong refugees from the Wat in Thailand is probably just over 15,000. But in Minnesota, as of July um, 2006, it's probably just over 5,100 uh, of these Hmong refugees have been resettled in the U.S. Um, and that is second to California. California probably has 500 or so more of them. And then Wisconsin is a distant third. And also there are uh, populations of these new refugees um, in Michigan and North Carolina in the hundreds. I'd like now to talk a little bit about the Hmong refugees from the Wat and um, sort of a, a bit of their demographics very briefly. And some of these numbers did come from a report that Ramsey County did just before, and Ramsey County in Minnesota did just before the resettlement started. Um, this group of refugees from the Watt, it's uh, quite a young population. And um, there was a survey they did at, you know, at the Watt prior to the resettlement, and they found that more than 60% of the refugees eligible for resettlement were under 18 years old. So a very young population. Um, and I know that was treated with a lot of su uh, surprise when the resettlement was being planned, that this was such a young population. But if, if we were to look at the Hmong population in the U.S. in the 2000 census numbers, about 56 percent under 18. So um, Hmong throughout the world, they are pretty young populations uh, demographically, and the refugees from the water just maybe slightly younger overall than the U.S. Hmong population. Also, there's a higher rate of literacy um, among this group of refugees, com uh, Hmong refugees, compared to the earlier groups of Hmong refugees who came in the 80s and, and early 90s. Um, they had more access to at least some schooling in Thailand, and especially the men did. 
Also significant numbers of married teens with children and this is pretty common with um, you know Hmong communities in Southeast Asia and also um, just the health conditions were pretty difficult in the Wat. It was not a UN sanctioned refugee camp. There was a lack of a good water supply and also just the fact that um, I mean pretty high levels of um, anxiety and possibly depression to among many of the residents due to the fact that their status was uncertain for so many years and the Thai government actually wanted to get them out of that temple even going back to you know the early 1990s. Okay, well I'd like now to get into some of the demographics of the Hmong community in the United States. And I'd like to talk about, or to begin, um, to talk about some of the issues with the Hmong uh, census data. I think it's important to be aware that, you know, the census does miss some people and there are some, um, you know, ne negative uh, things with the census data in terms of how it uh, counts the Hmong. And, um, you know, a couple issues here is the language barrier, of, of course, um, many families, um, you know, uh, there are different degrees of, of uh, ability with English and especially if the head of household uh, had some, you know, the English isn't real good, it may be tr hard for them to fill out the form. Um, so people may have been missed because of the language barrier. Also, um, with the census, you know, some of the, lar the larger groups like Vietnamese and Chinese, they have a, it's right on the census form, they just mark it off, but Hmong, they had to write it in. And so, I mean, there's a lot of reason to believe that that led to the numbers to be a little bit lower for the Hmong, because some people who are Hmong might have written in Laos or Thailand, for example. And also, I mean, I think there's, at least among some families, there may be some uh, distrust about giving a lot of detailed information to the government, you know, about their families and income and, and so on due, due to some of the experiences maybe they had back in, in Laos and Thailand. So um, we really believe here at the center and I believe that the census figures for the Hmong are an undercount and we need to keep these in mind when we look at the census figures. They're useful but they are definitely an undercount and now of course a lot of this, or this data is six years out of date too. So I think uh, even in Minnesota, the Hmong community has changed a lot, especially with the new refugees arriving. So we have outdated data. And of course the census is only done every 10 years. But uh, that being said, um, let's move now into the Hmong population in the U.S. As I mentioned earlier, um, the U.S. Census counted 186 thousand Hmong in the 2000 census. Um, usually again the community, the Hmong community organizations would estimate as much as 275,000 Hmong in the U.S. If we were to look at the top 10 states by Hmong population in the census, of course California by far was still number one in 2000. And then um, Minnesota, number two, and then Wisconsin, number three, and those were the top three states also in 1990. Um, Minnesota and Wisconsin have been catching up on California, however, in terms of a larger percent increase in population. Um, over the 1990s, North Carolina moved ahead of Michigan. Uh, there was a lot of growth in the Hmong population in North Carolina over the 90s. So North Carolina has the fourth largest Hmong population and then Michigan is, was fifth. And the bottom half of the top ten of, of, of states of Hmong populations in the U.S., uh, Colorado, Oregon, Oregon, Georgia, the state of Washington, and Massachusetts. And actually Rhode Island is just a, probably a couple, was a couple hundred uh, below Massachusetts. One other thing uh, that it's important to point out is that there have been some significant trends in secondary migration that we are aware of in the U.S. since the 2000 census. And um, quite a few Hmong have moved down to Arkansas and 
southwest Missouri and to a lesser extent northeast Oklahoma. And a lot of them have gotten into the chicken uh, farming industry. So there could be at least a couple thousand people down in Arkansas and maybe a thousand in Missouri. I'm not sure what the number would be in Oklahoma, but I, I believe it's smaller. Um, so these are, you know, these numbers in, in you know, the states in the, that part of the country are not reflected in that 2000 census data. Uh, we do not have good counts of the people down there. Um, we just have estimates um, from community leaders in, in those areas. So that's all occurred in the last five or six years uh, among moving to Arkansas, uh, Missouri, and Oklahoma. Let's get now to the, uh, or talk about the Hmong uh, population across metropolitan areas in the United States. And this is where um, sort of Minnesota has its area of distinction. Um, Minneapolis St. Paul by far has the largest Hmong population of any metro area in the U.S. with over 40,000 counted in the 2000 census. Um, probably um, the community estimates would be above 65 to 70,000 in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. Um, and then Fresno a distant second with 22,000 Hmong counted and then you can see there are several other uh, cities in uh, California and Wisconsin that round out the top 10 Hmong metro area populations. Uh, Sacramento, Milwaukee, Merced, Stockton, Appleton, Wausau, and then also Hickory, uh, North Carolina is number nine, and then Detroit area number 10. And what's interesting is um, if you went back to the 1990 data, uh, Fresno still had the most Hmong of any city in the United States. Um, Minneapolis, St. Paul in 1990 was a very close second. I believe it was like 17,000 in Fresno and 16,000 in Minneapolis, St. Paul back in 1990. So you can really see um, that huge increase uh, over the 90s uh, in the Twin Cities compared to Fresno and a lot of Hmong moving from California and other states to the Twin Cities metro over the 1990s. When we get into the Hmong in Minnesota, um, keep in mind that um, the census found about 42,000 Hmong in Minnesota in 2000. And about 24,000 of those uh, that were counted by the census, 24,000 just lived in one city, the city of St. Paul. So um, I guess that's about maybe uh, 55, 60 percent of the Hmong in Minnesota just, live in, or just lived in the city of St. Paul. Um, a distant second was Minneapolis with uh, over 9,000 and then Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park. Uh, just over a thousand each and we know those populations have really grown in the last six years in those two communities and then several suburbs bordering um, St. Paul in the East Metro, Maplewood, Woodbury, Vadness Heights and Oakdale uh, round out the top ten and uh, small communities in Rochester and Winona are also make the list. Um, we are also aware of um, growing Hmong communities in western Minnesota uh, Tracy, Marshall, Walnut, Grove area, and then also um, there is a small community in Duluth, Minnesota, and Taylor's Falls, which is uh, just about an hour north of St. Paul. So the Hmong in Minnesota are pretty concentrated in the metro area, but there are a few outstate communities as well. And I just would point out that we know there have been some changes since 2000 and uh, the new refugees the, from the Watt, uh, 5,000 have moved to Minnesota in the past two years or so and most of them have moved to St. Paul and to a lesser extent Minneapolis and then Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park. But very strong concentration of the new refugees in St. Paul. However, um, since 2000, a lot of the, the Hmong families who've been in Minnesota a while have been moving out to more distant locations. And um, 
even exurban areas, um, even an hour or more from the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, such as Elk River or Buffalo, Minnesota, Big Lake, Minnesota, um, and a little bit closer in uh, Anoka County, uh, Dakota County. So there's really been um, a lot of dispersion of the Hmong population across the metro area in the last six years, uh, according to uh, the, a lot of the information that, that we have heard at the center. It's important to, to understand that the Hmong community in Minnesota is a very diverse community. It's a, quite a large population and there's a lot of diversity within that population. So I'd like to give you some examples of diversity within the Minnesota Hmong community and there are other examples of diversity that we don't have listed here. I mean there are even other subgroups too. But these are some of the major ones. Um, there's diversity by religion and um, we, we don't have good numbers but um, we believe that the people who practice the traditional Hmong religion, um, the non-Christian part of the, the population is still the majority in Minnesota, but there are a growing number of Hmong Christians. And the largest number of Hmong Christians belong to the Alliance Church, and the Alliance Church has been active in Southeast Asia and China working with Hmong for more than 100 years. Um, so there's some really large Hmong Alliance churches in Minnesota, just like in other states. However, there are also many other Hmong uh, churches of different denominations, uh, Catholic and Lutheran and, and uh, Methodist and so on. So the Hmong Christian community has really been growing in Minnesota too. Um, also, there's diversity in terms of the dialects spoken. And the two major dialects of Hmong uh, in the U.S. that uh, spoken are Green and White Hmong. And sometimes Green Hmong is called Blue Hmong. Uh, the people totally understand each other. It's sort of um, like British and American uh, English. Um, we don't have good numbers, but we believe the Green and White Hmong are about 50, 50 in the population or pretty close to that. Also, um, another area of diversity is the 18 clans uh, and their leaders, and we'll talk more about the clans a little bit later. But um, there are 18 Hmong clans in Minnesota, um, and they have some of the larger clans even have their own organizations uh, that perform services for their members. There's also um, Hmong veterans groups, and um, there's a couple Hmong veterans groups, and these are veterans uh, who served during the war um, with General Vang Pao, and they stay active, uh, sort of as fraternal groups. Um, there's a two major Hmong, at, le at least two major Hmong veterans groups in Minnesota. Uh, there could be more than that. Um, also, there's professionals groups, um, nonprofit leaders. Uh, there is a Hmong Chamber of Commerce that's pretty active in the Twin Cities uh, as well. There's also activist interest groups. Um, th there's been a lot of young people in the community who have been active on sort of fighting for the human rights of the Hmong in Thailand and Laos. And there's also some groups over the years that have been active on women's rights in the Hmong community. Uh, for example, uh, there's a group that's been called the Hmong Women's Action Team in the Twin Cities. It's important to understand, um, in the newspaper there may be the same two or three people from the Hmong community who the, the media have sort of adopted as, as well, who they call the Hmong leaders who are quoted in, in the stories. But the vast majority of the Hmong in Minnesota are, uh, they live in, you know, they're members of working class families and not really part of that professional elite. Um, and now there's a, uh, a recent source of, of increasing diversity in the Hmong community, and that would be the Hmong refugees who arrived from the Wat in Thailand. And there are more than 5,000 of them in Minnesota. And of course, their experiences have been somewhat different than the Hmong who've been living in Minnesota for a while. So they may have different views on some issues as well. And it's really important to understand that there is not um, really one 
person or one group that speaks for the Hmong community. It is, it is very diverse in Minnesota. And when we see certain issues like uh, sometimes the marriage bill or other issues have come up in the Hmong community, there's a pretty wide variety of views. And it's really important for policymakers and, and people who work outside the community to understand that diversity in the community. I'd like to move now to Hmong demographics in the U.S. Um, we'll start with the age. And one very um, interesting uh, thing about the Hmong community in the U.S. is how, how young it is compared, how youthful it is compared to most other ethnic groups. If we look at the 2000 census data, the median age of the Hmong population across the U.S. was 16 years old, uh, compared to 35 years old for the overall U.S. population. And 56% of the Hmong population in the U.S. Uh, was under 18 in 2000, compared to about a quarter of the overall U.S. population. Another uh, thing that comes out of the census data, we can see that the Hmong household sizes are, are the average household size is a bit, quite a bit larger compared to the overall U.S. population. The 2000 census found the average Hmong household size was, about, was over six persons compared to about two and a half persons for the overall U.S. population. I'd like now to move um, to social economic status. And I think the really important uh, point when looking at this slide is the fact that um, we can see that over the, the last decade and a half, um, the Hmong social economic status in the U.S. has really improved. Um, for example, the percentage of U.S. Hmong families with public assistance income was cut in half between 1989 and 1999. So it was 60% as counted in 1989 and it was 30% in 1999. And also the percentage of U.S. Hmong families living below the poverty level fell from nearly 70% to about 35% between 1989 and 1999. So a lot of uh, improvement in social economic status across the Hmong uh, community in the U.S. Um, if we look at the census data, uh, we see the largest concentration of the types of jobs that the Hmong work in are in manufacturing, and that is true for both Hmong men and women. That's by far the, uh, the highest sectoral concentration in the economy. Uh, for the, the Hmong in the labor force in the U.S. is in manufacturing jobs, and that's mostly in assembly type jobs. And one other very important thing is the home ownership rate. And um, in the 2000 census, the Hmong home ownership rate across the U.S. was 39 percent, and that was up from 13 percent in 1990. And it's also really important to point out, it's not on the slide here, but um, if we look at almost every state with the Hmong population across the country, the Hmong home ownership rate in 2000 was above 50 percent. In Minnesota, the Hmong home ownership rate was about 60 percent. Only in California, where the cost of uh, housing is so high, was the Hmong home ownership rate below 20 percent, and that brought down the, the national number to 39 percent in 2000. So there has been a lot of social economic progress that we can see in the data in the Hmong community um, over the last 10, 15 years. And I do think um, since the 2000 census, there's, there's been a lot of, uh, very likely a lot of social economic gains as well that, that we don't have the data to show yet. Okay, well I'd like now to move into our um, Hmong culture discussion. And we're gonna start with Hmong clans. There are 18 Hmong clans in the United States. There have been more Hmong clans identified in China and some of the other countries in Southeast Asia, but it's usually accepted there are 18 Hmong clans in the U.S. 
The clan name is the same as the last name or the family name. And looking at the slide with the clans, you can see the 18 different um, Hmong clan names in the U.S. And the most common um, clans in terms of the numbers of people um, are Yang and Vang. So Yang number 18 and Vang number 15. I have seen some data that puts Yang as the top one in, our, in terms of p number of people and I have seen some data that puts Vang as the, the top one in terms of the numbers. The number three clan is probably in terms of number of people is probably number 17, Shang. And in Minnesota the, the Yang and the Vangs by far have the most people. However, um, in Wisconsin, Shong may have the most people. Um, but my sense is uh, across the United States, probably um, Yang and Vang have the most, like Minnesota. Some of the other more common um, clans are number one, Chang or Cha, number five, Her, number nine, Lee, which has different spellings. Number 11, Lor or Lo. Number 12, Mua. Number 14, Tao. And number 16, Vu. There are also some clans um, that are less than 1% of the Hmong population uh, in Minnesota and the U.S. And some examples of those clans with very small numbers are number 2, Chu. Number 3, Cheng number four, Fang, number six, Hang is pretty small numbers, number seven, Kang, number eight, Kong, number 10, Ku, and uh, number 13, Pa. Um, I think one good example of the differences in these numbers, um, uh, I think last year I was looking through the Hmong Times newspaper here in Minnesota phone directory and there were about nine and a half pages of the Vang listings, the Vangs in Minnesota, nine and a half pages and about three families for the, uh, I believe it was the Chu's number, number two. So there's just a very um, wide difference in the numbers of people in the different clans. Well, Clans serve a very important uh, function in traditional Hmong culture. Uh, they provide the basic form of social and political organization in Hmong society. And at birth, a Hmong person takes his or her father's clan name um, and remains a member for life with the exception of Hmong women who marry and take on new identities in their husband's clans. Uh, Hmong clans provide their members with social support and members of the clan are considered um, uh, brothers and sisters, or at least cousins, and they are expected to provide mutual assistance to each other. Um, the clans also provide their members with legal and mediation assistance. Um, for example, if a couple is going to get a divorce, uh, clan leaders um, from each of the two clans uh, involved with the families will get together to try to you know, to mediate the dispute and, 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 and make a resolution between the families for a, a divorce. And in some cases, uh, clans may also provide some economic assistance to their members. For example, uh, you might have a, a family that has moved to a new community and, um, you know, they may help them find, uh, some members may help them find a job or, or find housing and, and so on. I'd like now to move to the Hmong language. Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, the Hmong language branches into two dialects here in Minnesota, and that's the White Hmong and the Green or Blue Hmong. And these names represent colors in traditional Hmong clothing. As I mentioned earlier, the differences between the white and green Hmong dialects are probably not much greater than those uh, that distinguish British and American English. And we do not have good numbers, but it, 
we believe that probably about equal numbers of the American Hmong population speak white and green Hmong. However, um, the majority of books published in the Hmong language, and there are not that many of them, probably in just a couple hundred, um, the majority of books are in white Hmong. And um, there has been an effort in the past few years among, especially among some scholars, some green Hmong scholars in California to sort of get some recognition of the green Hmong uh, and, and also there's a different spelling for Green Hmong, the, the M-O-N-G spelling. Let's talk about the Hmong writing systems. Uh, in the modern era, a Hmong writing system wasn't developed until the early 1950s. And it was missionaries, it was Christian missionaries from the Western world who came in and worked with the Hmong to create a Romanized writing system so they could translate Bibles into Hmong. Uh, there were missionaries, Catholic missionaries, and also missionaries from the Christian Missionary Alliance Church who worked on developing the Romanized Hmong writing system known as RPA. Um, the Hmong language differs from English in that most words only have one syllable and of course a lot of English words have two or three syllables and even though the, a Romanized system uh, is the most common writing system for Hmong the sound system that goes along with the Hmong alphabet is very different from English so you have to learn an entirely new sound system with the Hmong Romanized alphabet. I would point out there is another Hmong writing system called Pahao uh, and there are some books, uh, you know, some books that have been published in Pahau, and Pahau is taught in, in some Hmong organizations here in Minnesota and also in California and some other states. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of the Hmong language. There are eight tones in the Hmong language, and you can see the tones listed on the slide. Uh, the tones completely change the meaning of the words that may sound very much alike to non-Hmong. Also, the Romanized system of Hmong uses tonal markers. Uh, so the last letter at the end of each word, we don't say that letter. It just tells us the tone we have to use when we say the word. And as I mentioned, the tone completely changes the meaning of the word. And the eight tones are listed on the slide from the, the lower tone, the medium tone, to the higher short tone. And um, some useful resource websites out there, if you would like more information on Hmong culture and, and, and uh, scholarly research related to the Hmong people, the Hmong Cultural Center website HmongCenter.org, and that has a complete listing of the holdings in our Hmong Resource Center Library in St. Paul. Also, it does have a lot of educational information about the Hmong culture. Um, HmongStudies.org is the site of the Hmong Studies Journal, which is a peer-reviewed academic journal that has uh, put out more than uh, six issues. Uh, since 1996 and more than uh, 40 scholarly articles related to Hmong studies. And also MongStudies.org has extensive uh, Hmong studies bibliographies on it and also annotated bibliographies with descriptions of, of research that has been done over the years and, and reference information for the various dissertations and scholarly articles and books in Hmong studies. So that's a very good website for research in Hmong studies, MongStudies.org. The learnaboutmong.com site is a multicultural arts website. It has examples of several important Hmong folk arts forms, and also it has um, several multicultural education presentations and PowerPoints related uh, to the Hmong history and Hmong culture. The learnaboutmong.com. Hmongnet.org, also known as the WWW Hmong homepage, uh, was the first uh, Hmong 
substantive Hmong related website I believe that ever went up on the internet and it, it was put up in 1994 and it is still going strong and I'm actually now serving as the editor of it and the the www Hmong homepage Hmongnet.org it's sort of a portal website it lists links to a lot of research resources and organizations um, and also it has announcements of, of, of community events from around the country. So that's a very useful website to stay up to date, um, especially on uh, research, but also just on uh, Hmong related resources. And then finally, um, the Hmong Archives website. Um, the Hmong Archives is, is not uh, affiliated with the Hmong Cultural Center here in St. Paul, but it also is, is sort of a unique history collection. And um, it is located in St. Paul, and it, it's ho some of its holdings and just information about its collection are listed up on its website at mongarchives.org. In closing, um, we would like to invite you um, to visit the Hmong Cultural Center in St. Paul. And on the final slide, you will see uh, the address listed uh, on University Avenue in St. Paul and the phone number and the website and the email address. Um, feel free to stop in at the center if you're visiting St. Paul and you, and you need uh, you know, resources um, as a professional working with Hmong or for a research study. Um, you know, the center is open 9 to 6 Monday through Friday and by appointment on the weekend. Thank you.